Contests are a really great way of spiking Apple podcast reviews. And then if you're doing a contest simultaneously to that, you should be filling out Apple's placement form so that they can catch whiff of the fact that your contest is really spiking your reviews and your downloads, which means if they pick you up for their new and noteworthy section, that's a whole other, you know, ball game of visibility that you haven't even initially considered. Hey, everybody. I recently had the opportunity to sit down with Fatima Zaidi. Fatima is the co-founder and CEO of Quill. Uh, Quill is a marketplace for podcasters and anybody who does freelancing in the podcasting industry in case you need someone to help improve your show. They also do branded podcasts. They're a full service uh, production company that will help brands create really great podcasts uh, to showcase their stories and connect with their um potential and current customers. So it's a really interesting conversation about brands and why you should be starting a podcast, why brands should be looking at podcasts. At the end, we started talking about a lot of podcast growth tips. Quill has a really good method for growing podcasts and how to consistently get listed in Apple Podcasts new and noteworthy. And then we wrap up at the end with a talk about personal brands. If you are an indie podcaster, how do you know uh, whether or not you should be building a personal brand? What things should you be doing? And what are the values there? So it was a really interesting conversation. I learned a lot and I hope you do too. Let's get to it. Fatima, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. It's pleasure as always. (laughs) It's my pleasure. Let me uh, start off by asking you, how did you get into podcasting? What brought you to our little corner of the internet. Well, I think it's a corner that everyone was noticing. But, you know, back in 2014, when Sarah Koenig launched Serial, I think it, I remember my best friend from Oman calling me up and saying, you know, Fats, there's this new murder mystery. And it's about this Pakistani guy. And of course, I have Pakistani roots. And she's like, this, this, this teenage boy has been convicted of, of murdering his his girlfriend. And I think this is right up your alley. But it's in a weird format. It's something called a podcast, which is like some Somewhat of an audiobook, and and I had no idea what she was talking about. But being the um, murder mystery connoisseur that I am, I, I I you know took a look, and the rest is history. I mean, serial after that became a household name. It made podcasting a household name. And at the time, um, I was running a marketing agency for a Fortune 500 companies. We did marketing and PR, and I was looking at new ways to create content to reach new audiences and. Uh, that was back before podcasting was, you know, mainstream. Uh, so that's when I became a consumer and started exploring it as an opportunity for some of our clients. That's awesome. I remember when really it was that serial moment. That's actually very close to when I left law to join the world of podcasting. Podcasting jumped from something under 100,000 podcasts, maybe like 60,000 in the world, to now close to 2 million and the landscape has changed completely. With all of that change, what prompted you to think that this is like something that's going to continue to go that you wanted to invest in even more? You know, it's so interesting because when I was launching Quill, so I decided to sell the last agency and productize our services. So really specialize in podcasting. And everybody told me that I was absolutely nuts because, you know, it was a very niche industry. I went from my market size being every company who needed marketing to specifically companies who were exploring podcasting, which was a very new medium. But the way that I looked at it was there the industry for agencies is very saturated, but there's not a lot of podcasting agencies that actually know what they're doing. Folks who not only can create really good content, but also understand audience growth, understand analytics, understand the ins and outs of reaching the right audiences. And so from from uh, filling a market gap, that was kind of a no brainer for me. But I would say the the thing that I you know really got to me was the exponential growth within the industry. Actually, I think we're almost at four million podcasts. I was recently uh, reading up the Pod News newsletter, and they said something in there about we're almost at four million. Um, and I don't know if I'm like quoting that inaccurately or not, but I, I think we're we're almost there or getting there. And I think it's more so just the growth, like 4,000 new shows popping up every week. And last year, this time, we were at 900,000 active podcasts. So it's um, especially further compounded in the pandemic where it's definitely not a fad and here to stay. 
Yeah, I know on the Buzzsprout side, um, we about tripled during the pandemic as far as our company size. And there's just, it was pretty much spurred by people who are really interested in starting new podcasts. They were all of a sudden had a lot of time at home and figured out, hey, I've been saying I want to start a podcast for a long time. Or maybe they were just feeling a little bit disconnected from a lot of their people they used to spend time with. And they went, hey, let's start a podcast and started leaning into this new medium. Totally. So the way you got into podcasting is you saw this opportunity and you founded Quill. What is Quill? Yeah. So Quill is a full service podcast production and marketing agency, which means that we work with Fortune 500 brands to create content, but also uh, market the shows. I always say creating a good show is half of the work and the other half of uh, the battle is really reaching the right audiences and making sure that all of this great content is being promoted. Um, I will say, though, that we are a very tech-enabled agency. So we have the Marketplace, which is for anyone who can't afford agency pricing. You can go on and hire podcasting experts. So think of it as the um, Upwork or Fiverr of the podcasting world. And then we actually just launched a beta version of a new audience growth tool um, that we're also going to be using for enterprise clients. And essentially the product we created for our agency clients, but we'll soon be opening it up to the mass market as well. So, And so you have both sides, you have kind of that full service and you have also the marketplace that, who is that marketplace really geared towards? Yeah. So full service agency is more towards brands who want a team of folks around them. And then the marketplace is more for indie podcasters and content creators who may have limited budgets, but still want to put out a really great show. Um, and essentially what we've been doing over the last couple of years is uh, we love being in the service space and creating shows because that's where you really learn the pain points of the industry and what the challenges are. And then based on those challenges, we create products to solve those um, pain points. So you really specialize in this brands aspect. Mm -hmm. And I know I've heard you speak. I've listened to a lot of podcasts with you really like kind of pinpointing the value proposition for a brand to start a podcast and really selling that idea. What, why should a brand actually start a podcast? Oh my goodness. I could go on and on about this. This is so much content to share here, but I would say the biggest reason is that it is typically a medium that is not available to other advertisers. I can be driving to work and listening to a podcast, but I cannot be watching a Netflix show. I can be watching the dishes and listening to a podcast, but not, um, you know, reading an article. And I think that it's important to understand that 94% of folks who start a podcast end up listening to the entire show, whereas a 30 minute video only has about a 12% completion rate. And mm -hmm. that disparity in numbers is that uh, typically when you're trying to reach educated millennial professionals, they want to be productive, whatever they're doing, they want to be actively engaged in another activity. And this is one of the only mediums where being engaged in another activity increases engagement rather than hurts it. And so, you know, it, it's the only advertising medium that is available to folks that isn't available to any other form of marketing, whether that be content written. Um, and everyone consumes content in a different way. Some people prefer our visual, some people prefer audio. And so, you know, you really want to make sure that you're reaching all types of audiences. If it's YouTube, it's Gen Z. If it's podcasts, it's older millennials. If it's, um, you know, LinkedIn or Facebook, you're typically looking at an older generation. TikTok, you're looking at Gen Z. Uh, so if you're, you know, eliminating podcasting from your marketing strategy, it's a whole slew of people that you're not thinking about people like myself who exclusively consume content in the form of audio. We have definitely seen that on the Buzzsprout side, the same piece of content that we may release as a blog post, a podcast, and a YouTube video. Um, I've shared these numbers publicly, but I think it's something like three and a half minutes is our average blog read time, four and a half maybe is our average view time on the YouTube video, which is really highly produced. And then if someone starts the podcast, we're on average expecting them to listen to 90 something percent of that podcast. Yeah. It's so like 40 minutes mm -hmm. and the amount of effort that goes into each of those mediums is entirely different. And I think you pinpointed it when you said it's because podcasting's take, podcasting takes into account you're doing something else. Podcasting is not trying to dominate your time. So everyone should be, if they're not, you should think about it, go out and work out every day. And when you're working out, 
pop in a podcast, listen to some music. Like those are good times to do something else. And uh, I think that's why we get so much better engagement because we're doing something else and we're not maybe as I don't know, prone to like switch kind of like haphazardly between content. Yeah, definitely. I mean, it, we know it's one of the best ways to reach a global audience, create an intimate connection with your customers, with your audience, your listeners, and provide valuable on-demand content. And so we always encourage anyone who's creating a podcast, whether you're a brand or an indie content creator, that there's a lot of work that goes into creating a good show. So you should repurpose that content into other formats. Podcasting is great for those who prefer audio and for those who like to be actively engaged in another activity, but you should still be putting it out in the form of a blog and YouTube and social media media clips, which is exactly what you just said. Um, and repurposing that content means that you can continue to reach new audiences in new places. And, um, you know, you're, you're really not doubling up the work. What you're doing is it's just a smarter content strategy. On other podcasts, I've heard you say in the future, brands are either going to have an, their own podcast or they will be advertising on somebody else's. Why? First off, like, why do you think that that's the future? How, what do you see that leads us to that future? Yeah, so I think the quote that you're referring to, and I have been, you know, infamously using this quite often, is that in the 1980s, we had a phone number for our business. In the 1990s, it was a website. In the 2000s, it was social. And and I think in the next five to 10 years, it's going to be podcasting is going to be our medium. And for a variety of reasons, I think from an engagement level, we're finding that um, it's just a very intimate sort of platform or medium where the host becomes an influencer and you start to trust their product recommendations and their advice and their opinions. I think that it's a very easy, um, it's a, it's not an easy production process, but it's a very easy consumption process. Like, you know, the way that you can get access to a podcast, the way you can distribute, the way you can listen to it is just at the tip of your fingertips. Um, and, and more importantly, I think that it's become a very accessible medium these days. Anyone with, you know, you don't even need a microphone or a headset. You essentially need your phone to record content. Not that I recommend recording on a phone. Um, I'm all about the high, high quality production. But, you know, even if you wanted to create, you know, content for your friends and family, you know, it's just so easy to put together a podcast and it's readily available to anyone who has an internet connection that um, I think that, in 2007, if you were the first person on Twitter tweeting like Kim Kardashian, by default, you're an influencer today. And I think the people who are podcasting today in the next five to 10 years are going to be the influencers. There was definitely a moment where actually t- so the first conference I ever went to for podcasting was in December 2014. And I remember someone there telling me, well, I don't even know if it makes sense because I already missed the boat. You know, the whole wave of podcasting has kind of crashed. <laughs> If I'd started two years ago, I'd have a great show, no. but now it's too late. And I think back on that all the time, seven years ago, and had you just stuck with it, it doesn't matter how bad that show had been in the beginning, it's seven years of work on it, he'd be you know, millions of downloads per episode doing incredibly well with his podcast. Think of the SEO he would have built over the last seven years and the backlinks he would have gone just to rank on Google when people were searching for similar content to his. Also, I think that that's just such a ridiculous statement because we're, okay, we're between two to four million podcasts. I'm going to, after this podcast interview, I'm going to double check to see what that stat is. But let's say we're at two to four million podcasts. There's 60 plus million YouTube channels there's 1.5 billion websites there's 500 hours of content being uploaded every minute and 30 plus million um 600 plus million blogs and 30 plus million youtube channels so podcasting is very much at the beginning of the hype cycle um and only 18 percent of those podcasts are active so we're like not even we haven't even scratched the surface of content yet so that person you spoke to um very misinformed Well, he was speaking at a time before we had 100,000 shows. And so um, definitely, you know, missed the opportunity. And I hope that he maybe is uh, listening now and maybe he actually has a podcast again. Um, It'd be fun to go back and find that individual. So we're thinking about brands starting a podcast. You're kind of telling me a bit about how podcasts are going to continue to grow. 
What is the specific reason, though, why a brand should have their own podcast? So I'm thinking of like a Salesforce. Mm -hmm. Why does Salesforce need to have a podcast? Why for them would it not make more sense to say, hey, I've got my um, one of my marketing directors, go ahead and buy $4 million of podcast ads across all these shows. We don't have time to create your own internal podcast. Where what what am I missing? Yeah. So it's it's really interesting because I think day to day we all walk around and there's so many, you know, behemoth brands that we know of, Amazon, Google, Facebook, McDonald's, Slack, Salesforce, but we don't know their brand story. We have zero emotional mm-hmm. connections to them. And and this is a story that I share with everybody. I, I, our household, our entire household are huge ice cream consumers. And when we used to go to the grocery store, we were never exclusively loyal to any particular brand until we heard Jer- Jerry and Tom, I think it's Jerry Greenfield and Tom from Ben and Jerry's on how I built this, the how I built this episode with Guy Raz. And um, after that episode, I felt such a profound connection to their brand, their brand story, their mission, vision, and values that we exclusively now buy Ben and Jerry's. I don't think it's the best ice cream product on the market. I think that Hagen does, and, and there's so many other um other flavors and and brands that are probably more superior than Ben and Jerry's, but I just love their company so much. And since then I've been following them through so many podcast episodes and, and, you know, their black lives matter movement statement that they put out. And, And since then I just have developed an attachment to their brand in a way that goes so beyond product consumption. And that's what I find podcasting can do for your brand, especially if you're B2C. So a B2C company can come on and tell their brand stories, talk about, you know, what they're doing behind the scenes. And you're no longer just a company. You know, it's very much humanizing what you're doing behind the scenes that your customers don't get to see. But if you're a B2B company, there's been studies shown and actually Quill internally has been tracking this with our B2B podcasting clients that show Anyone who is doing a podcast who makes a list of prospective clients that they want to close contracts with or vendors or partnerships with, um, about 60 to 70 percent of those folks that they have come on their show will end up at some point within the next six months closing into a larger contract. So it's not just a marketing strategy. It's a really powerful sales tool. One hour in front of somebody, what better way to build a relationship with someone than having them on your show? So B2B, I would say great sales strategy, B2C, great brand awareness tool. I actually recently ran across a story that I think it was during the civil rights era that there were the CEO of Coca-Cola said that he wanted to have like an interracial dinner and was getting a lot of pushback from like civic leaders in Atlanta. And he said, that's fine. I'm going to move the entire company out of Atlanta unless we sell out. And it sold out within like two hours or something. And I was like, it was just like this little anecdote that I heard. It probably was very well known 50 years ago, but- I'd never heard it and I already had high brand affinity for Coke, but I heard it and I was like, man, that's a really cool story. I like feel a, you know, I'd never even thought about who's the CEO of Coca-Cola until that moment. And I think we consistently, um, it's why people are in love with Tesla, that they have some, they've actually built a connection in some way to Elon Musk or maybe for a lot of people with Steve Jobs and Apple computers, like learning the stories of the individuals and just the brand story is really powerful for totally. consumers to build a, cer- a totally different level of connection. Absolutely. I mean, Sephora, their podcast Lip Stories, where they profile female pioneers and each lipstick brand is named after a different powerhouse I mean, like, what a great way to bring different diverse perspectives to the table. And I'm sure that their podcast, I mean, they haven't released sales stats, but I'm sure that they've had really high conversion rates from a product perspective. And then, you know, there's brands that I have never given second thought to, General Electric being the perfect one. When they released the message, the podcast, I, and I thought it was an interesting concept, you know, solving extraterrestrial messages using General Electric uh, products. It's so cool you know, kooky and quirky. I was like, that's so interesting. And it really put their brand on the map. And that's not to say nobody knows what General Electric is. Of course, we all know it's a household name, but do we really know what they do? Do we really care? Now we care because we've listened to their podcast and now that relationship is so much more intimate. So, I mean, 
you know, there's tons of studies. I, I recently wrote an article um, quoting some BBC stats that actually show you specifically the impact that it has on your brand favorability, purchasing intent, brand awareness, um, up like, you know, uplift and in, in purchasing intent and, and really like specific metrics on on brands bottom lines. But I would say, you know, all of that is secondary. Like, of course, sales is always a priority. But first and foremost, what you're trying to do is stay top of mind with with people who are seeking out your content. That's really interesting. I didn't prep this question. So feel free to uh, dodge it if you'd like. That's a so that Sephora podcast. Yeah. I'd never heard of it. I think that's a really interesting way for them to highlight their product and to also connect to their audience in a meaningful way. 100%. Are there other brands that you see doing interesting podcasts? And could you kind of tell the stories behind them? Yeah, absolutely. So I am I listen to 10 podcasts a week. And I would say five of them are usually branded podcasts. So I try to diversify content from, you know, the the New York Times, the Gimlet's, the Wondries of the world with like smaller indie shows, and then also branded shows. There's a bunch of podcasts that I highly recommend if for those tuning in or looking for recommendations. Slack has two podcasts. Um, one is called Slack Variety Pack. It's an older one. And then the new one is Work in Progress. And I love both of those shows because it aligns so well with their brand messaging and positioning. Their entire um, product and their entire business mission is to help teams work better together. That's why Slack was produced. Um, And their entire podcast is about profiling business stories where teams have worked together to solve problems. So I love that one. One thing I've noticed is, so I've seen brands do this um, on Buzzsprout. We had a customer who... I forget how we initially connected, but he was uh, doing a podcast about setting up call centers and his actual job was setting up call centers. Uh, He would, people would outsource it to him. He set up their call center. Once they hit a certain level and they needed to have a large call center, he would set it up and he started just talking about the process. Here's the KPIs you should be using. Here's how you hire. Here are the red flags you have with managers. Here's the equipment. He would just everything in a podcast. And what he realized was even though he was only getting, I think, around 150 downloads per episode, the people he was constantly in communication with, obviously one way, were the decision makers in his industry because they were actively looking to find, all right, we're doing this call center thing. What's the best equipment? Oh, here's a podcast and here's someone talking about (laughs) it. And they started listening. And he said eventually they would start reaching out being like, hey, this is so much harder than we thought. Do you, would you would you want to come on and help us? And he's like, yes, this is my whole business. That's amazing. I mean, I'm telling you, it's like the best sales tool ever. And actually, the more niche your podcast, the more engaged your audience. I mean, we it's so funny. We have a client who has an open banking podcast. And who knew that there was literally a cult-like following for open banking content around what the world? What is open banking? So um, this this client of mine, so the podcast is called Mr. Open Banking, and it's under uh, our client Axway in the U.S. They're based out of Phoenix. They have two podcasts. They have one, which is business stories. It's called Transform It Forward. And then um, A.L. Sivan, who is the host of Mr. Open Banking, he is an open banking expert, which is cross-border banking, um, which, yeah, no, to people like you and I would be like, Okay, I don't know if I would tune into an open banking podcast in my spare time, but no, there is a huge audience for open banking content and it's one of the most popular shows in our roster and it actually makes sense because it's such a niche topic and there's probably not a lot of content on open banking. So he, like your friend, is reaching a lot of those, you know, executives, decision makers, open banking, and he's constantly getting poached because he is creating content that is just a very specific topic that not a lot of people are. And I always like to tell our clients, you need to fall under one of the three categories when creating shows. The best, the the, the first, the best or different. If you're one of those three categories, you're going to have a really good show. Yeah. I always talk to people about, you really want to be the best in your niche and you can define that as narrowly as you want. And if you want to be the best interview show, well, now you're going up against um, Terry Gross <laughs> and Ira Glass and Joe Rogan and like all these big yeah. names. Well, you're gonna it's gonna be hard. And then if you start narrowing it, you can get down to this very, very small niche 
And that can feel limiting as a content creator because you're like, oh, are there really people who want to listen to my open banking podcast or a podcast about setting up call centers Mm -hmm. or whatever you do the podcast or Dungeons and Dragons or whatever your podcast may be about. Uh, but the thing that you gain when you niche down is you make it easy for your listeners to find you and know within a minute, this is who I want to listen to. So yeah. I'll give an example. One of my college roommates uh, was really into weather and he would chase tornadoes and loved hurricanes. And you know, he was the only one that I ever knew who was like that. And that was like, I was like, okay, that's something kind of you are into. Well, there's a whole group of people. And eventually he met two other people who are really into it. Now his job is he films all these weather events and sells the footage to like Netflix and news stations. But he started a podcast called Tornado Trackers. And it does exceptionally well because he's not unique. He was unique in the small college environment that we were in, but he's not unique when you reach a worldwide audience of people who are like, oh, I'm really into weather. And then when he put that podcast up, he kind of flew this flag and all of a sudden people were like, well, yeah, that's what I've been looking for my whole life. And if there was anyone who knew like my cousin's really into weather and they heard about his podcast, (laughs) they go and they run to the cousin. They go, hey, you've got to listen to this podcast. It's actually for you. Where these really big shows, I rarely listen to, though I love it, This American Life, and think, oh my gosh, this is for my dad. I've got to go tell my dad, this is the episode for you or my cousin. But if there was, you know, when people have a specific interest, it's very easy to connect them 100%. to a specific show. Oh, totally. And it's and it's interesting because when... Clients come to us and they say, we want to do an interview or like an interview style podcast where we're interviewing, you know, business leaders. And I'm like, okay, great. So you want to compete with the guy rises of the world. Like there's already a how I built this. This is what I love about eBay's podcast, um, The Message. They actually, they wanted to do the same thing. They wanted to interview business leaders, but they actually decided to profile the business failures. Um, and actually the only podcast out there that I think actually does that, like all of these shows out there that will, um, interview success stories, but no one actually focuses on like the ones that don't make it and why they don't make it. And like, you know, I I was really blown away when I listened to their podcast. I think they may need some help in the production department, but as like a concept, it was like, wow, you've really nailed figuring out a niche that nobody else has sort of monopolized yet as a brand too, which is impressive eBay, if you're listening, <laughs> check out Quill. They uh, they could definitely help you with that production side. Uh, all right, so here's something that I thought about as I've experienced more branded shows. And like you said, people started getting their phone number, then their website, then their social media. Well, phone numbers are basically fungible. Everybody gets a phone number. They're all just as good as any other phone numbers. But then when it gets to a website, and social, a just getting a website up, I don't see almost any value in that unless you're actually putting some effort into it and you're really engaging your audience. And then in social, it even gets, the stakes are even higher where if you have like a dead social account, okay. But if you actually have actively like you're not engaging your audience or maybe you're even offending your audience, um, you really need to be brand appropriate. And sometimes just kind of just doing it because you have to do it doesn't really get you anything. So my question is, how does a brand approach a podcast in a way to say, we want to be brand safe. We want to be on point. We want the production to match the brand that we're building. We may be incredible in shoes, but we're not incredible in audio. How do they do all that? (laughs) That's a really good question. It's um it's interesting because it's really finding that balance between understanding that, you know, people connect with you based on your personal stories, not carefully crafted tweets or scripts. And so you really want to make sure that there's an authenticity component to the content that you're putting out and you know, it's always really difficult to sort of find that bridge when it is a brand because there's so much at least, you know, red tape around what you can and can't say. Um 
I was reminded of like when you brought that question up, it reminded me of the Justine Sacco story. Do you remember that whole scandal with them? Um, I don't think so. Justine Sacco was a PR executive who worked at IAB, which is the holding company that um, they owned Match and Tinder. Uh, I okay. think they still do. And she was uh, getting on a flight to South Africa and she tweeted, going to South Africa, hope I don't get AIDS. Just kidding. I'm white. And she thought she was being funny. And by the time she landed in Cape Town, a reporter had found this tweet. It had been retweeted thousands and thousands of times. There was paparazzi waiting for her at Cape Town Airport. The hashtag has Justine landed yet was trending. And of course, she'd made international headlines and been fired. So think about the... The publicity that Tinder and Match and these holding companies got from it. And it's a perfect example of you can say one stupid thing on air and digital lives forever that can absolutely ruin this brand that you've spent so long building. So don't be a Justine Sacco. The rule of thumb is don't say anything that you wouldn't want plastered on a billboard with your company logo next to it. And don't say anything that you wouldn't want your mom reading. Those are sort of my two benchmarks for what you should and shouldn't say. And in terms of, um, you know, Making sure that your online and offline brand matches, whether you're a content creator or a company, I think it's really about um, telling a business story in a way that actually resonates with the audience. So not carefully crafted tweets, but bringing in a personal element to it. So the um, the personal anecdote story that you recently just shared, actually, in the earlier part of our interview was like the perfect example. I would say the um, Ben and Jerry's example that I shared really where they talk about their personal stories and and why they decided to act, you know, advocate for the Black Lives Matter movement and um, why they decided to put people before profits, like explaining all of that in a way that really humanizes you uh, rather than being promotional and salesy. That is always the goal when it comes to creating good content. That's a good distinction. Um, a lot of brands I see once they get a platform, they think the goal of this platform is to get more sales. And you're basically building a podcast so you don't have to buy the ads on the same podcast. But it's kind of a different message. You're the you know, if you're just being salesy and you're just buying advertisements, then you probably are just trying to say something along the lines of, Hey, Coca-Cola, it's delicious. Like you love it. Go buy some um, versus a actual branded podcast. You are telling the story of your brand. Here's the values we have. Here's how we're trying to change the world. Here's what we're doing for our employees, our customers, et cetera. Um, but how does the, I guess like still like the technical work of recording a podcast of branding it, of getting it to sound as polished as, uh, you know, maybe you are in your shoes or in your lipsticks or in whatever thing you actually are creating, you're probably not exceptional at creating audio, especially stories for audio. Are there things that you would recommend clients, potential clients, brands looking at building a podcast? I mean, if you're a brand, you should be working with an agency. If you have budget, you should be working with an agency. And if not an agency, there's some really great freelancers out there that you can also tap into. And I think there's this misconception that you have to spend a lot of money to create a really good show. Serial was created on a very limited production budget. And I think people sometimes forget that they you don't really need to pump, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars into creating a really high quality podcast. And, you know, there's obviously the basics that everyone should know. Don't record on your phone. Don't record on Zoom. I was very excited to get a Riverside link from you because I was like, okay, <laughs> he obviously knows what he's doing. Um, Riverside is my favorite platform. One of the least glitchy sound optimized recording softwares. And it's so so simple to navigate, but hey, I'll even settle for a Zencaster or a Squadcast or, you know, one of those platforms, clean feed. Uh, don't use conference calls. Don't use Anchor. Don't use anything free. If it's free, there's usually a reason for it. Um, and so that would be my first thing. Like, don't compromise on audio quality. Uh, the second would be it actually isn't very expensive to hire an editor to clean up your audio and input some music and even transitional signposts and soundscapes to really tell that story and give listeners a break from the conversation. Um, you can use generalist platforms like Fiverr and Upwork to hire someone even offshore for like $20. They could do it per episode. Um, so you're not looking at a huge capital lift. Uh, 
Um, and then, you know, the, there's the investing in a good microphone, investing in good headphones, um, making sure that you are distributing your show on all of the channels. So not just Spotify, Apple, and Google, which are the main ones, but there's CastBox and Overcast and and Stitcher and iHeart and a lot of the smaller players as well, where a lot of people consume their content, uh, making sure that you're, you know, working on the organic side. Podcasting is a marathon. It's not a sprint. You, you know, like your friend who gave up seven years into the game, you, it, it's like building your personal brand. It's you, you're gonna see momentum slowly over time, and it's about continuous growth. And one day you're gonna wake up and you're gonna have two million followers or two million downloads, like Jordan Harbinger. But that was not an overnight success. All right, so you you started touching on growing a podcast. Um, growing a podcast, in my experience, has been exceptionally difficult um, because podcasting doesn't have an algorithm, and we are really. Uh, having to connect to our audience and then convince them to listen to the show and then retain them. It's quite a long process to get somebody to listen to the show. And when I think about pitching, let's say I'm pitching my boss at Salesforce saying, Hey, you should start a podcast. Um, you know, if two months in we're looking at download numbers and we're only seeing a thousand downloads per episode, I think it'd be pretty easy for them to say, can it, um, we're not spending, VP level time interviewing people or having these conversations if we can't reach more than 50,000 customers. One, is that the right way to think about it? And then two, how do we grow a podcast so that we know it's successful? So yes and no. It, it I do understand the ROI justification and I spend like 90% of my day convincing and talking to brands about it's usually the CFOs and the CEOs and explaining what the ROI of podcasting is. And and what I would would say is that it's not about the mass downloads. If you're looking for, you know, the 50,000 people reach, then you should be doing digital advertising. Like it's all about the Google and the Facebook ads and Reddit and LinkedIn ads. It, podcasting is about reaching a niche audience and it's all about the engagement piece. And so this medium shouldn't be looked at from a, how many downloads do you have? It should be looked at, yes, downloads matter, but how engages your audience? Are they listening all the way through to the end of your content? Are they dropping off in the first 10 minutes or are they staying on until your conclusion? Uh, what's your average consumption rate? Those are the metrics that I need to be looking at, not just your number of unique listeners. I do understand the the ROI justification, especially if you're a Salesforce, you're probably putting a lot of capital into your show. And that's where having a production agency that really specializes in audience growth helps because those folks can really, um, like Quill spends majority of their time when it comes to marketing shows. We don't focus on the organic tactics. We're not doing social media for clients or writing out blogs. Clients can do that themselves. We're doing things like paid advertising. So Spotify ad studio, um, uh, podcast addict, overcast ads. Um, we're doing the very industry specific targeted ads that are very ROI and data driven. So for every dollar you're putting in, you're seeing how many of those are coming, how much money of that is coming back to you and unique listeners and downloads. Um, and so that's how you sort of have to approach your podcast. It's almost like how you approach your business. Um, it's like the justification of spend really needs to come down to how you're measuring your analytics and your metrics. And it's a combination of data-driven marketing with also benchmarking and realistic expectations. So talk to me a little bit about some of those tactics. You said Spotify ad studio, um, overcast ads, podcast addict. How do those tactics work? Yeah, so our I would say the marketing tactics that we explore are sort of broken up into a few different categories. In terms of paid advertising, uh, what we do is a ton of promotion on the listing platforms. Uh, so unfortunately, Apple is not open to advertising, not yet anyways, but all of the other platforms are. And so things like um, Spotify Ad Studio, you can target people in Spotify who are already listening to podcasts based on age, location, as well as interest. So what other similar shows are they already listening to that are comparable to yours? So it's a very warm lead and pretty high conversion rates. Uh, we actually 
We're one of the first uh, agencies on Ad Studio, so we've worked very closely with the Spotify product team to um, sort of evolve with them through throughout their Ad Studio journey. And um, they have a two hundred and fifty dollar minimum spend, so even if you're not a big brand, you can advertise with them. Uh, and Spotify actually recently launched um, this year. They launched a marketplace as well that's very similar to Megaphone and Acast, where for a particular ad spend, let's say you have a thousand dollars to spare, you can invest that into their marketplace and they take the top 20 shows in your category and they advertise on those podcasts, um, which is a really great way of reaching a very dedicated listener base that are seeking out your content. So listing platforms is definitely the way to go. Um, Podcast Addict is the Android version of Apple Podcasts. And unlike Apple, they actually allow advertising. And the cool thing about them is they can give you impressions. They can give you how many people clicked on the ad, which Spotify does too. And they also show you how many people subscribed to your podcast. And then under your hosting platform like Buzzsprout or Simplecast, you can go to the technology section and you can actually see how many of those people converted into podcast downloads. Um, so you can get pretty accurate with with like, you know, figuring out how far your dollars can stretch and what your customer acquisition rate is. And similar to these two metrics, there's, you know, Overcast, there's um, like so many paid, my Megaphones Marketplace does really well. Um, Acast recently launched one as well. Um, yeah, like, like CastBox is another one. They're usually sold out of ad slots, but if you can get your hands on one, they're great. I'm trying to think of what else we do from a paid. I think that's it from the paid side of things. We find social ads don't work. Social ads are yeah, really same. great for likes and comments and engagement, but don't do anything for podcast downloads. Um, and then there's the industry specific tactics like we apply for all of the awards. We have a master sheet of all of the podcasting awards to get on uh, people's radar. We write articles for different publications on best podcasts to tune into. Um, so I'm one of the writers for various publications on that. We own the Quill Reviews, which is very similar to Podchaser, where we um, write out customized reviews on different shows. So people for SEO it really helps them with their um, visibility for new listeners. Um, contests are a really great way of spiking Apple podcast reviews. And then if you're doing a contest simultaneously to that, you should be filling out Apple's placement form so that they can catch whiff of the fact that your contest is really spiking your reviews and your downloads, which means if they pick you up for their new and noteworthy section, that's a whole other, you know, ball game of visibility that you haven't even initially considered. So for a smaller podcast, especially indie podcasts, um, Apple New and Noteworthy is something that they really want to get involved in. It sounds like you actually have a little bit of a secret yes. on how to get listed in Apple New and Noteworthy. <laughs> yes, it is a little bit of a, a trade hack that I'm sharing with everyone. I uh, Quill doesn't believe in holding anything close to us. We we love collaborating, competitors and all. We The best way to get on Apple's new noteworthy section is to do a contest, external or internal facing. If you're a company that's more than 500 people, I recommend that you do an internal facing contest. And if you're a smaller organization or even just an indie um, content creator, then do an external facing one. Your call to action should be subscribe to my show and leave me an Apple podcast review. And then once you see those spike in Apple podcast reviews, your price can be, you know, 10 gift cards to small businesses around the US um, or North America. Please don't do Amazon. We don't want to make Jeff Bezos any richer than he is. <laughs> <laughs> and then once you see those spike in reviews coming through, you should apply on Apple's webpage on their Apple placement form. And uh, this form is for anyone who wants additional visibility through Apple and they can cross collaborate to see um, if the show is worth it for them. But if they're seeing the type of analytics you're bringing in through your contest, it's kind of a no brainer for them. Oh, that's incredible. It's a great way to try to go around and figure out how to get into Apple Podcasts, new and noteworthy. Yeah. Our clients uh, at Sick Kids Hospital just got featured um, a few weeks ago, and we like, you know, their listeners spiked like 30% over, over the period that Apple picked up their show. Wow. That's incredible. Do you see over time that people actually stick with the show after that spike from Apple, new and noteworthy? Do most people just listen and drop off, or are they actually sticking around? 
Yeah. So for most of our clients, our retention is amazing. And that's something that we very closely monitor. Our retention curve is like probably the most important metric for us, making sure that anyone we're driving to the show is staying on for future episodes. I would say that 100% comes down to content. Retention, if people are dropping off within the first 10 minutes of your show, like your content needs work, maybe your production quality needs work. Um, you know, it shows that it's not an authentic contest if people are coming on, subscribing, and then bouncing as soon as they claim their prize. Um, so it's a really good learning opportunity for you. Like, what are you doing, you know, that what what could you be doing differently to retain those listeners? I like um, the other tactic that you kind of alluded to is buying ads inside of these podcast apps. And you differentiated that from buying ads on social. Yeah. I, from you know, talking to thousands of podcasters have never, I've, I've talked to one person who claims he can do it. I've never seen anyone show me, um, anything except losing a vast amount of money on Facebook ads or social ads when trying to grow a podcast because, and this is my theory, at least you are giving people a little taste of a podcast, but you have no knowledge of whether or not they actually have a podcast listening habit. And if they don't have a podcast listening habit already, it's it's a hard ask to be like, hey, you like that 30 seconds of this podcast? All right, go ahead, download a new app. Then, yeah, it's the purple app that's been on your phone forever. Okay, undelete that, subscribe to the show, and now start listening to me. That's a really big lift versus somebody is already in, if someone's already listening on Podcast Addict, they actually aren't using a default app. This is an app they downloaded mm-hmm. or they're using Overcast. It's not the default app. They are a podcast junkie. And then they see this ad for a show that may be perfect for their brand. That's a very light ask to say, click it, listen to an episode. And if you like it, subscribe. The um, The connection, the ROI is so much better than social ads. It's not possible. Like I I can pretty much guarantee it. Like social, we've done so much advertising on all of the social platforms from LinkedIn, Reddit, Twitter, Facebook, Google. It's you're wasting your money if your success metric is podcast downloads. If you want likes and comments on your social posts and brand awareness, and by all means, drop that money. You're, you know, it's about brand awareness and reaching mass audiences. But I can pretty much guarantee at this point, it's not going to equate to podcasting downloads. It's it's kind of a shot at the dark. You know, you're hoping something sticks, whereas the listing platforms, they're already listening to podcasts, like which is a very small subset of the market right now. So you want it to be a warm lead and you want it to be very targeted. And um, actually, another tactic that I didn't mention that I probably should give them a shout out because they're amazing is if you are a new podcast, I highly recommend advertising on industry newsletters. I religiously read pod news every morning. And so any new podcasts that are launching that are being advertised in pod news, I'm subscribing to them. And then pod move is another one, which is podcast movements. Buzzsprout has one as well. Um, I don't know if you do advertising externally, but I don't think you do. I think you're just, I read yours religiously. Pacific content is another one, but pod move and podcast movement are two that I highly recommend. All the industry consumers are reading that article or newsletter. And so such a warm way of reaching those qualified leads, but social is a no go. Social media has always been, has this promise out there and it's like, oh, if you can do social media, then you'll do exceptionally well. And from a business marketing perspective to podcast marketing to a lot of stuff, I'm like, social is a good place to connect with your audience, to do some social listening, to learn about your customers. I have struggled so hard in convincing people you meet on social to buy from you later or to listen to your podcast or take actions out of social media because the time that you're spending on TikTok or on Twitter or on Instagram or wherever you are, it's often these moments that are just kind of filling a little bit of a void. You're like, oh, I have nothing going on right now and I'll flip open my phone and check something out. It's pretty difficult as certain types of brands to through organic reach get people and say, Hey, why don't you go take an action Mm -hmm. right now? Um, when all those platforms are also very targeted on the only people who really get access to get people off the platform are really the people paying the money, uh, to do that. Yeah. I mean, I think you sort of hit the nail on the head, which is it's a really great way for you to connect 
and understand who your listeners are. One of our clients um, at the end of or at the beginning of their podcast, they always say, tweet at me and let me know where you are and what you're doing. And so you'll have people on their feed who are tuning in from New Mexico, Dubai, you know, Egypt, and they're walking their dogs or they're driving to work. And it's such a, you know, great engagement tool. It's such a great way to know who your audience is, what they're doing, um, and get to know them better. But, you know, beyond that, I don't think social and podcast downloads have much correlation. That's a really interesting idea to build engagement on social for your podcast. It's a great way to get some like feedback. I'm definitely going to use that one and recommend that to other podcasters. Definitely. So one other thing that I think we've talked a lot about brands and, but a lot of the people who Buzzsprout reaches and a lot of people that will watch this show or listen to this podcast are indie podcasters. And they're often people who are building a personal brand. Mm -hmm. And so I know you have a lot of thoughts about building a personal brand, especially when it comes to public speaking. So can you give me the pitch for why should people be Mm -hmm. talking in public and how, why should we even be building a personal brand at all? Yeah. I mean, look, everybody has a personal brand. It's what people are saying about you when you're not in the room. And so if you already have a personal brand, you might as well refine it, hone it, and work on the positioning and messaging of how you, um, you know, sort of what you want to leave behind, I would say. Um, I think that there's three reasons why it's important to have a personal brand. The first is We all know when we're about to go on that date, hire someone, apply for that job, the first thing that people are going to do is Google you. And if the first thing that comes up are pictures of you drinking tequila in high school, then it, you know, not really going to help you stand out. Um, The second thing that I find really cool is that you can choose what you want your personal brand to be around. Mine happens to be podcasting. Um... But you can choose what you want your brand to look like. And that is a really cool thing. You can refine and control that narrative. And um, I would say the last thing is that, you know, we all like, you know, whether it's looking for a job or whether it's hiring or whether it's connections or contacts, your, your personal network knows you for your personal brand. And the stronger your network and your brand, the more you can leverage and the more you can tap into people. And so, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say public speaking is the way to go. I would say if you enjoy public speaking and you're good at it, then absolutely. It's a lot of work, but it's a really great way of connecting with people and, you know, building your network one handshake at a time. But I talk to so many people who want to build their brand and they want to start speaking. And the first question I ask them is, well, do you enjoy speaking? And they're like, oh, no, I hate public speaking. I'm so scared of it. Then why would you want to spend so many hours building your brand around a tactic that you're not good at and you don't enjoy. You know, building your personal brand is a full-time job. It's, again, like podcasting, a marathon, not a sprint. And if you're going to be spending so many hours, please choose something that you're good at, that's aligned with your skill set, and that, you know, feels authentic to your brand. I'm sure you love podcasting, Albin. I mean, I can just tell from this, like, (laughs) hour and a half that we've been talking that you probably really enjoy speaking to people. Um, It would be very obvious to me if you didn't and if you weren't good at it. I think uh, I had an interview with Kate Casey, who does a podcast called Reality Life with Kate Casey. And she said, you really can't compete with somebody who enjoys what they're doing. Um, She has five children. She started multiple businesses. She's running a ultra successful podcast. She's doing so much stuff. I was like, when do you recharge? And she's like, this is the recharge. Like, this is what I love to do. And it's very difficult to compete with people who are enjoying something. If you're enjoying it, then you're going to do exceptionally well. um, And you're going to make the time for it. But if like, you know, it's good to face your fears. But if you're realizing like, I had a realization at some point that the practice of law was not the thing I was ever going to love. (laughs) Then you kind of need to pivot away from that so that you can be in an area where you will succeed just by virtue of enjoying the thing that you're doing. Definitely. I had no idea you were a lawyer, by the way. Um, That's so interesting. You've always been Albin, the podcasting guy. (laughs) I have always been. I've been in podcasting a lot longer than I was ever in law, I guess. So very short time, uh, short-lived legal career. One thing, though, that I see with personal brands a lot is imposter syndrome. We either get people who are like not an expert at all, and then they're hosting clubhouse rooms, giving advice that is just 
totally off the wall and not accurate. And then on the other end, we have pretty accomplished people who still, by virtue of them seeing how much they could grow personally, they see, oh, I'm not qualified yet to speak on this subject, and they hold themselves back. How do we help people, especially people who are already qualified to start speaking and building a personal brand, how do we help them get over that hurdle? I think imposter syndrome is is very normal for just everybody in the and not just in the, the podcasting industry, but when I look around in my network, especially women, I find that they're you know very afraid of coming across as too promotional or opinionated or assertive, and they don't want to put up their hand and take credit for their ideas or promote themselves and and build their brand and. Oftentimes, I always like to remind people that you are CEOs of your own personal brand. And if you don't advocate for yourself, nobody else will. That's not to say that I don't ever feel imposter syndrome. But I also try to remind myself that nobody else has more or less of a right to be doing exactly what I'm doing. Really, the difference is just going for it. And so... um, On the days where I'm not feeling particularly confident, what I do is I over-prepare. And over-preparation equates to confidence, means that you don't don't leave the room for imposter syndrome. I really like that answer. I can see that myself sometimes, that the moments where I'm very anxious about doing an interview or something, you put in another hour or two of research and you start writing out your answers, your potential questions it really does start to dissolve some of that fear. Absolutely. A hundred percent. I love that. And I think that this is for everyone across the board. You know, if you are going to be judged on a critical lens, you just, the margin of error is very low. And so you shouldn't give people the opportunity or yourself the opportunity to not be overprepared for every opportunity you walk into. One thing I've also noticed um, sometimes is helpful for people with imposter syndrome is remembering it's very difficult for a true beginner to learn from an expert. Um, A lot of times a beginner needs to learn from someone who's just like beginner plus or maybe like an intermediate level. Mm -hmm. And so if you're six months into your podcasting journey, sharing, hey, here's what it w- what it's been like for me. Here's some of the hurdles that I've overcome. Here's some of the stuff I've learned. You could think, well, what about somebody who's already been doing this for 10 years? Um, you know, I'm not at the same level as them. Well, there's actually people who can't really learn from the 10-year veteran. I think of Terry Gross as like one of the best interviewers, mm-hmm. um, especially podcast interviewers now. And the stuff that she talks about is so far above my level that I <laughs> often think, I don't even know how applicable this is. Um, to me, it's hard to learn. But if there was somebody who is, you know, may not feel empowered yet to teach their tactics and things they've learned, those actually might be the things that are just two, three levels above me that now are speaking right to the lessons I need to learn. Mm-hmm. It's like that simple phrase or quote, there's something or someone for everyone. I like truly believe that when it comes to content as well. That's a good. There's uh, your con- if your content can be for just a few people, it can be their content soulmate. And uh, yeah, exactly, can, content soulmate. I love that. And you can't you can't <laughs> be everything to everyone. And if you're creating your podcast to try to reach everyone, you're 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 already setting yourself up to fail. All right. So lastly, before we go, um, you have also started a conference that's really specializing in helping brands understand branded content and podcasting. COVID kind of wrecked the first one and stopped you from having the second year, but Listen In Conference is coming in 2022. Tell us about this conference and what you're doing. It's coming. I mean, unless the Delta variant decides to mess it up again for us, (laughs) we are hoping to be able to pull it off this year. So we, the first couple of years, like last year and this year, we were supposed to have our conference in LA at the Millennium Biltmore. The entire conference is about supporting brands who are creating branded podcasts and, you know, helping them take their shows to the next level. So it's a mix of corporations and Fortune 500 companies who are interested in podcasting along with industry professionals like yourself. Um, 
Our headliner is Sarah Koenig. I know we talked about her earlier in this interview. So she it's a full circle moment for, for me because she was the reason that I got into the industry and started consuming shows. And so uh, last year when I was thinking about who I wanted as our headliner, it was kind of a no-brainer. I wanted to go back to the roots. So she's coming out to talk about um, just the impact that podcasts can have on brands as well as how to create really good content. Um and I think hopefully by then season four of Serial should also be launching. So hopefully we can also get some uh, intel from her on what that might look like. Um, but yes, I really hope to see everyone there. It's going to be on June 23rd, 2022. Plenty of time for this, you know, interesting year to be over. I hope to see all of you there, whether you're a content creator, whether you're a brand, whether you're an industry professional. Uh, it'll be some really great networking. And it's LA. It's always a good time. It's always a good time. It's actually the hotel that I think Podcast Movement Evolutions is mostly held in. And uh, it's a great venue and a, just a blast to be in downtown LA. Uh, so Fatima, before we go, tell us, uh, I know you're pretty much active on all social media, um, but if people want to connect with Quill, if they want to build a branded podcast, where should they find you? Yeah. So I, if you want to find me, it's not hard. I'm pretty much everywhere. All of the channels, LinkedIn. Uh, the only thing I'm not on is TikTok. I just like haven't given into it, but um, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, Zadie A. Fatima is my handle. Quill Inc. is the handle across all of our channels. Um, if you are listening today, please tweet at Albin and I and let us know who you are, where you are, and what you're doing. Albin, what handle should everyone be tweeting at us um, well i'm always at alvin brooks so you can find me there perfect and we'll we'll definitely tweet back and and that's how we start the engagement sounds great thank you so much for uh being generous with your time and spending the day with us um hopefully we'll talk to you soon thank you for having me